Back in 2017, the Thunder would send promising young talent Victor Oladipo and Domantas Sabonis to the Pacers in return for superstar Paul George, kicking off a new era of Indiana basketball. This was clearly a move for the future, as the two were just 21 and 25 years old, but what they quickly found out is that Oladipo was already capable of being the guy, winning nearly 50 games en route to a top 5 seed, and very nearly knocking down LeBron and the Cavs in round 1. Of course, injuries would prevent us from seeing out an extended prime, but in that time we saw a glimpse of what looked to be the NBA's next great two-way star. So just how good was he? Young Oladipo was an absolutely ridiculous athlete. Just look at how quickly he changes speeds, leaving J.R. Smith in the dust with a simple hesitation dribble that takes him all the way to the cup. That burst was among the best you can find. Off the catch, he's given space to attack to his left, and in just one motion, he's moving way too fast for Kevin Love to even have a chance at getting in front of him. Here's another one where he's given space to take that first step, and in just two dribbles, he's basically teleported himself to the paint, where he goes vertical off of two feet to finish over the top of a helping LeBron James. This speed made him a lethal weapon in the open floor. He's able to build momentum while gathering a loose ball, and although LeBron has a huge lead, he's unable to close off a route directly to the rim for two. This time, he's away from the ball, but it's the same thing using his speed to beat the defense to a spot with space to attack, and going right by James for a little scoop layup. During that 2018 season, Oladipo averaged 5.5 points in transition, good for 4th in the NBA, only behind historically dominant names like Westbrook, Giannis, and of course LeBron. And just like any great fast break player, this is also where he'd do a ton of playmaking, pushing the ball right down the middle of the lane to force recovering defenders into committing before dropping it off to a running teammate. Vic and JR start this play in similar spots on the court, but because of that speed, he's able to gain a few steps of separation, which is all it takes to turn a potential 3-on-3 three -three into a 3-on-2. Three George Hill's forced to stop the ball, with nobody in position to step in front of Corey Joseph. Here it is again. As he builds up that head of steam going down the middle, Cleveland only has two defenders back, and as soon as JR commits to the ball, that leaves Darren Collison with an open runway to the basket. This time it's off of a defensive rebound. Oladipo grabs and immediately takes off, but quickly recognizes that Collison has the defense beat, moving the ball up with a great pass in stride that results in yet another easy layup. And when there's no easy outlet available off the rebound, he just takes it himself. It's a 4-on-3 advantage, so he knows that by applying that downhill pressure, the defense is forced to leave someone open, patiently waiting as Collison frees up for a practice jumper from above the break. Oladipo was at his best when given space to build ahead of steam and get downhill, and he'd use that to his advantage by attacking in a similar manner in the half court. Look at how much space he's given to work with as he brings the ball up, and by starting his attack early, his man is forced into a backpedal. With a simple change of direction, he's able to dart his way in close for two. Here's the exact same thing, except this time instead of throwing the in and out directly into a crossover, he uses that momentum to blow by his man going right, and it all happens so fast that helping defenders aren't even able to react. Although LeBron's out multiple feet beyond the arc on this one, Oladipo's legitimately starting his attack from inside the logo, throwing a crossover straight into a hesitation that opens up LeBron's hips and gives him an angle to explode into with that speed, on his way to the rim. These hanging hesitation dribbles were his go-to for exploiting space. By pausing for a brief moment as Collison comes to set a screen, JR's forced to open up his right hip and protect the opposite side but that just gives Oladipo an angle to get to the paint, and although Help's ready to meet him down low, he's able to cut right around that too with the reverse finish. Another go-to of his was the misdirection, stutter stepping in between dribbles as if looking to drive right, only to aggressively take off with the left, before coming to a screeching halt for an up fake, and two points plus the foul. Here's that same misdirection move, appearing to attack right while simultaneously setting up an angle to the left, 
except this time his defender completely sells out to the paint with a quick backpedal, instead giving him space to pull up for a mid-range jumper. It's not just from inside the arc, but from three, where he was a threat to score off the bounce. This is the exact same play, except instead of selling out to the paint, Nance takes a slight hop back inside the arc, which is more than enough room for him to comfortably knock down the triple. Those exact same hanging hesitation dribbles and misdirections that are used to set up driving angles would also help him leverage the threat of those drives into more space on pull-up jumpers, and because he's so good at quickly shifting his momentum and staying on balance as he stops and pops, as he gets into these attacks there's no real way to tell if he's exploding downhill or looking to set up a jumper until the very last moment, and by that time it's probably too late to get a proper contest. That stop and pop game also made him a huge threat to pull the trigger when pushing the pace, most notably in semi-transition, where again, at times you sort of have to play him for his drives and live with the results of his pull-up shooting. In 2018, he hit just under 36% of his off-the-dribble threes on about three attempts a game, both really solid marks, and there was even some versatility in how he created them drawing a second body up top as he looks to attack in space and using his speed to get the step on Thompson going right, which sends him barreling into the paint, before slamming the brakes and stepping back into a now wide open jumper. And when backing it up to attack in space like this, he'd also use high ball screens to help as a sort of roadblock. Corver jumps out in a hedge but is nowhere near quick enough to contain a drive before recovering, and now JR's forced to defend with an open hip, and by now I'm pretty sure we all know how that story goes. Oladipo was a multifaceted threat when coming off of screens, and defenses primarily had to worry about him turning the corner with speed. Love comes up near the level of the screen, and although he does a solid job of positioning himself to take away the middle of the floor, there's still an outside angle available, getting the step and going baseline for the finish. And this time, when Nance jumps out to instead take away the outside angle, he darts back to the middle to split the gap, and the result remains the exact same. Reminiscent of a young Dwayne Wade, his ability to attack aggressive coverages like this was second to none. Thompson's up near the level and positions his hips in a way that's meant to protect the middle of the floor and force the ball into help going left. But by giving Oladipo just an inch of space, he's able to change directions going back to his right, and without a path to the rim, he instead falls back on a little floater. He would also punish these coverages by patiently keeping his dribble live, first looking for an angle to shovel the ball into Sabonis, which gets closed off, before pulling back into a drive now that the space has cleared, and using a couple lengthy strides to finish around Kevin Love down low. And like many other things, because of the speed, Biggs often just had no chance of containing him in space. Thompson does everything right to force the ball into an awkward angle while moving his feet to buy his defense time on the recovery, but it just isn't enough as Oladipo works his way in close for two. Here's another example of that. Love jumps out real aggressively in an attempt to get the ball out of his hands, but by pulling back out and finding a new angle to attack, he's able to easily take him off the dribble, and with Thompson in position to protect the rim, he instead goes to a pull-up midi. And that's the thing, even if the defense was able to prevent him from touching the paint, they still had to worry about that shooting. Love is back in a drop, and that's just too much room for him to step into a long two. I talked about the three-point threat, but he also shot over 44% on pull-up middies, a huge mark, and that three-level scoring threat left him a real strong operator in the pick and roll scoring 8 points per game while landing in the 85th percentile in efficiency. Scoring of that caliber in so many different ways, when paired with his ability to get into the defense, of course opened up playmaking opportunities, and he had a pretty diverse set of ways to capitalize on that attention. Again, he starts his attack near the logo so that he can build up steam going downhill, and because he easily gets the step on love, Corver's forced to slide down and help protect the paint, leaving Miles Turner all alone in the corner for a high quality look from three. And here's a real similar play, except attacking to his left. 
Thompson's forced to contain the ball, while Clarkson slides down from the weak side to tag Sabonis on a roll. And Oladipo's capable of making that live dribble, off-hand pass across his body to Corey Joseph, as he steps into an open three of his own. It's the same thing when he had to deal with those more aggressive coverages. This screen and roll creates an opening right away, and with a basic shovel, he's able to get it to Sabonis on a short roll drive. Here's another one where he leverages the threat of an outside drive to create a slight opening to split down the middle. And when two defenders rotate to meet him in the paint, he leaves it for a trailing Thaddeus Young, resulting in another opportunity for his team to score at the rim. At times, it almost felt like Oladipo was making the defense pick their poison. Cleveland almost sort of zones him up by sending a blitz with Jordan Clarkson coming way over to protect the middle, but that doesn't stop him from splitting the double and firing a bullet to Joseph in the corner, as he's left with a practice jumper. That's not to say he was flawless in these actions though. It's worth noting that when he didn't have room to turn the corner in space or quickly create an angle with his live dribble, he could struggle as a decision maker. You'd see him pick up his dribble, rush some passes without surveying the floor, just signs of a playmaker who doesn't quite have that top-notch processing speed, which did leave him vulnerable to increased turnovers. Another way in which he'd turn the ball over is by simply losing his handle. It was clear at times that he lacked ball security, could struggle controlling through tight spaces, and would even just change directions or speeds too quickly for his own good. These issues are somewhat reflected in his number of touches and how they relate to his turnovers. He was never a ball dominant guy, averaging just 64 touches a game that season, 48th in the league. But with that came about 3 turnovers, 11th in the league, and in comparison to other guys, that is a relatively high ratio. Albeit in just 7 games, we did see an increase to his time with the ball in the playoffs, as do most stars, up to 76 touches a game, and the turnovers followed suit by increasing to nearly 3.5, again a relatively high mark for someone who wasn't a mega playmaker. And it wasn't just his decision making that raised some questions, he also had a few noticeable limitations when it came to his driving and finishing in general. Take this play for example, he's met with aggressive pressure and pulls it way out to near half court, using his speed to take a wide angle around Larry Nance, picks up his dribble from just a step or two in from the perimeter, and does his best to avoid contact on his way to a reverse layup. Now, he does convert, so on the surface, it may just seem like I'm cherry picking things to complain about, but what I'm focused on is the fact that he never really did quite figure out how to use his body to initiate contact or create through added physicality. Every step he takes is with the intention of avoiding defenders, which led to less free throws. He got to the line a little over 5 times every 75 possessions. Which isn't at all a bad number, but in comparison to other high volume slashers is pretty low. This also meant he wasn't as good at generating paint touches or finishing at the rim through traffic, and it's especially noticeable how much he struggled to score when dealing with contact. Another problem I think he had was that he never really developed a true short mid-range game as a counter for when he can't get to the cup. He does a great job of relocating so that he can attack a closeout, and when Clarkson rotates over to slow his momentum, a simple floater or short pull-up jumper over the top would suffice. But instead, he elects to first avoid contact once again by repositioning his body and jumping to the side while going up and under, just to get rejected. And he pretty routinely launched himself into some really tough looks down low like this, as a result of not utilizing the short mid-range, which did hurt his scoring to some extent. It's important to note that he's worthy of being compared to elite slashers, so in assessing his game, I do have to nitpick some of the areas in which he struggles. But when you step back and look at it from an overview, he was still one of the game's most talented drivers. His ability to get to and convert at the rim were both major value adds, even if he wasn't quite in that very top tier of guys, and the amount of pressure he was able to put on the rim in so many different ways, of course opened up more playmaking. I talked about some of his reads out of the pick and roll, which are a lot more set and can be reactive by nature, 
but he really could create for others out of any scenario. Here's an isolation where he throws a hesitation straight into a between the legs dribble as he burns Korver, forcing Love to slide in front of the ball and dumping it off to Thad Young for the lay. This one starts with one of those spacey half court attacks, the hanging hesitation dribble to get the step down the middle that draws Korver to the nail and leaves Bogdanovich relatively open on the wing, drawing a foul on the closeout for a 4 point play. This time it's from a standstill, JR comes up to meet him with aggressive ball pressure off the catch and he explodes past him with that quick first step, before skipping it cross court to a wide open Collison in the corner for 3. And that's something I really didn't touch on, Oladipo was also capable of attacking from a standstill like this. He first jabs right before attacking left, but Smith is able to cut him off, so he counters with a spin back towards the middle for a reverse finish. Here's another one, LeBron plays him aggressively so he first looks to beat him on a dribble drive, and once he gets that first step down the middle to force him into recovery, steps back for a 3 that he just buries. The ability to play from both a standstill and in space made him an incredibly effective scorer in isolation. His 1.03 points per possession were good for the 89th percentile among qualifying players. So, what you have in totality is a strong self-creating scorer who can do so at all three levels, with some versatility in how he gets into his own offense, whether that's in transition, isolation, or in the high pick and roll. He's a great slasher who could get to the rim consistently and convert as both a scorer or playmaker, which does give his on-ball offense a pretty high floor. With that said, he does have some limitations as a driver and finisher, flaws as a playmaker that lead to increased turnovers with more reps, and lacks the truly elite passing you want in a number one guy, which does hold him back as a primary creator on a true contender. But what about his game away from the ball? He wasn't a huge off-ball guy, not a great or active mover, and someone who rarely scored off of cuts despite the athletic finishing, but where he did have some utility was as a shooter. He's not someone the defense could just leave open, hitting over 39% of his threes off the catch, and these weren't just stationary spot-up looks, but commonly off of movement and with some degree of difficulty. Indy's offense would regularly run him off of screens, primarily in set actions, curling off of pin downs or coming off of handoffs, and the big thing here is that he was just as comfortable moving to his left as he was to his right, and because he had a smooth motion off of movement in either direction, this really helped bolster the team's versatility. And it of course drew the respect of opposing defenders. After giving up the ball, he quickly relocates to the perimeter and Smith makes sure to close out. But off the catch, Oladipo immediately sees an open Miles Turner and quickly moves the ball one pass over to a great look from the top of the key. His ability to connect the offense like this through quick decisions and ball moving was in my opinion his most valuable off-ball trait. On a backdoor cut, Smith slides down to take away the middle, and with no hesitation he quickly fires the extra pass to Lance Stevenson, and the ball just moved too fast for an effective closeout. Even if he wasn't some off-ball wizard, I do feel pretty confident in his ability to maintain that offensive value next to another creator or on-ball guy, or fit into multiple different schemes. Overall, that leads me into viewing him as a lower level all-star on offense. The on-ball value with some nice complementary skills would leave him an extremely valuable number two on a contender, just on that end of the floor. What takes him to another level though, is that he was also one of the best defenders in the game at his position. But before we get into that, I want to give a quick shout out to Basketball Index for helping with this analysis. If you're not familiar with the site, they provide tons of statistical measurements, tools, and easily accessible graphics. They also offer various different talent grades, and through their player profiles tab, I can easily compare them to other players around the league. Using Oladipo's finishing as an example, on this page I'm presented with various metrics detailing his ability to create and make these shots, along with how he stacks up against his peers. 
By signing up with the code VENUE30, you can get 30% off your first month subscription. So I'll leave a link in the description below for anyone interested. And with that being said, let's take a look at Oladipo's value on the defensive side of the ball. Now, he wasn't a guy who would go out there, defend a team's number one option, and just take them out of the game like a Kawhi Leonard. He wasn't necessarily a great defender in isolation, could struggle getting around ball screens at times, and didn't have much switchability. What he did have though was amazing hands. LeBron drops the shoulder and throws Oladipo off his spot, creating separation to set up for a finish but Victor uses his length to attack the ball and strip it away. He was a true pickpocket. This time on a closeout, JR looks to make the extra pass to Thompson, but before he can get rid of it, Oladipo takes a swipe and starts one of those fast breaks going the other way. Where he was primarily utilized was as an off-ball chaser. If the other team had a movement shooter, that's who he was sticking with. And on Cleveland, it was Kyle Korver. Instead of staying attached to him off a pin down, he uses his speed to shoot the gap, and reaches out to steal the pass. Here it is again, he's engaged and ready to help on a ball screen, but as soon as it gets to love, Korver starts moving into a dribble handoff. Oladipo goes over the screen, and again just erases the pass with those lightning quick hands. In general, his activity and instincts for defending off the ball were top notch. As LeBron attacks and spread pick and roll, he slides down to the nail and forces yet another turnover. And this time he's serving as the low man, first rotating to take away a pass to Nance down low, quickly recovering so that Smith isn't left alone in the corner, and when the ball gets to the paint, he picks up Nance once more, taking away a routine dump off. Despite standing just 6'4", he's a guy who could legitimately offer resistance around the rim through timely help plays. In semi-transition, he picks up Clarkson, quickly rotates to help take away a Corver drive, then slides in front of Nance to just destroy the play entirely. And the timeliness of his rotations and masterful positioning helped him serve as a deterrent like this. Here's a basic pick and roll that draws Turner to the ball, so Oladipo slides in front of Nance and plants his feet for a charge. Here it is again, he's the weak side low man so it's his job to erase any potential advantage created in the pick and roll, and when Thompson seemingly has a runway to the cup, he's right there to draw the charge. Although I will say this one's a little bit questionable, considering he's pretty clearly in the restricted area, but the process remains good. These instincts, when paired with his foot speed and quick hands, made him an absolute wizard in passing lanes, routinely blowing up plays with high level reads, as his 3.8 deflections per game were enough to land him at 4th in the NBA, while leading the league at nearly 2.5 steals. Overall, I do think of him as a strong all defense caliber player. By nature of guards not having the same effect on a team's defense, I don't think he was quite a defensive player of the year type of guy, but along with names like Jimmy Butler or Drew Holiday, I think you could make an argument for him to be the most impactful non-big. So where does that leave him as an overall player? Just to take a look at some numbers that help gauge value, the Pacers outscored opponents by 6 points per 100 with him on the floor and were outscored by more than 7 when he sat, a 13 point swing that was good for 4th in the league. Albeit in just 7 games, that trend only continued into the postseason, dominating Cleveland in the Oladipo minutes with a net rating of 12 and a measly negative 12 with him on the bench, a 24 point swing that led the entire playoffs. These plus minus numbers are only a part of the picture though, and can lack some context, so if we take a look at some notable all-in-one metrics that adjust for lineups, teammates, opponents, and incorporate things like the box score or optimal tracking data, they all pretty consistently come to a very similar conclusion, and that's the mark of a top 15 or so all-NBA caliber player. I tend to agree with what the data is saying here. Personally, I do view him as a solid All-NBA level guy, typical of a top 12 to 15 player, and I'd even go as far as to say that I think you can make a really strong argument for him to be in the top 10 pretty comfortably, 
depending on how you think his game would translate into a deeper playoff run. The scoring, playmaking, and brilliant defense were enough to make 2018 Victor Oladipo one of the best players in the world. If you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn my post notifications on to be first on more content. If you're interested in my more in-depth research, make sure to check out my website and social media profiles. You can find those links in the description. Feel free to let me know down in the comments what you thought of this season from Oladipo. As always, I hope you all have a great day, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.